Good morning, everyone, and welcoming, welcoming, welcoming. Wow, where did that come from? <laughs> welcoming. I don't know whether that's camping and welcome we're, we're split together or what. But anyway, welcome to worshiping. I think that's what happened. I left out the two were, and I just went with welping. Welcome to worshiping with uh, in styles. Everything's going smoothly this morning, as you can tell. It is good to have you worshiping with us this morning from Sealy's Bay United Church, wherever you may be. It is always wonderful to have this opportunity to worship together. Even though we are separated by space and sometimes time, we can still come together through the miracles of technology. And so we are back in 3D this morning, Dave, Don, and Dan, and uh, we are delighted to bring this worship service to you. Have some announcements for us as we, we get back into things. Uh, a few things. So Bible study, uh, we have one more before we take a summer break, and that'll be on Wednesday, the 30th at 7. And uh, we're continuing on with Proverbs, chapters 11 and 12, chapter 22, 17, on to 23, and chapter 31. If you'd like to be involved in, in Bible study, just let me know through my email, dgstyles at hotmail.com and uh, we will, I'll forward the Zoom link on to you. So one more to go. And then after that, we do have an announcement for Wednesday, July the 7th at 4 p.m. I've been asked to share this with you that there will be a thank you on the lawn of the DeGraff family uh, farm across the street from, from where I live on Main Street. So that is uh, rain or shine at 4 p.m. on the 7th of July at the DeGraff Farm Front Lawn, 171 Main Street. And that is an opportunity to give thanks to the family for the use of their land as part of the Vita uh, Coors Trail. So I know people were asking some questions about crowd size and that sort of thing, and I, I'm honestly not sure how that, how that will play out, but uh, perhaps people, if there's anyone who's from uh, the Sealy's Bay and Area Residents Association online, maybe they can just let us know, but because I think there's still some limitations, even if we're, we're separated by space and time, so, uh, or space anyway. But that's the, that's the plan, is to have an opportunity to come together and thank them for, for allowing us to use that land for that glorious trail that's out there uh, and all the, the wonders that are in that world there. Our chicken barbecue rides again for Sealy's Bay United Church. That's on July the 17th, and it's uh, going to be down at Centennial Park. And uh, if you would like to book tickets, we're, we're, we're looking to sell tickets in advance so we have a strong sense of numbers as we are going to have uh, pickups down at the park. If you would like to book tickets to, to order meals, that you can talk to Chris at 613-387-4048. Uh, or you can talk to Bonnie at 387-3264, and I'll post those numbers as well on our Facebook page. And uh, we're, we're also hoping that we can do an advanced payment on that, so it would be preferred if you, could, if you were able to do uh, a, an e-transfer on Interact for, for us to do that. We do have that set up in place. So Chris at uh, 387-4048, or Bonnie at 387 3264, and that's for getting your tickets for the chicken barbecue coming up on July the 17th at Centennial Park. Also, a car trunk sale is upcoming, and that's on the July the 24th, and that's a fundraiser for the entire pastoral charge, and that's also at the park. Keep Stay tuned for more information about that. And then I think we still are planning a bake sale on the 31st. That's the long weekend, July the 31st. Uh, in front of uh, Carol Johnson's home, just across from, from uh, Kelly's uh, Fresh Mart. So that's on the 31st of July, as far as I know. So again, there'll be more information about that one way or the other coming up. I think that's it for announcements, as far as I know. So, it's a lot of things. We're keeping busy. As we prepare ourselves to enter into worship together, we illuminate the Christ candle and we take a moment to, to, to reflect, to quiet our hearts, to still ourselves, 
from the sometimes hectic pace, even in the summer, And I share these words of call with you from Gil Lefebvre. Welcome, welcome to worship. Although we are apart, we are united in this time of praise and thanksgiving. Let us glorify the name of our loving God. Welcome, welcome to God's peace. In this time, may we put aside our urgency and anxiety and resist the distractions of our fears. Let us open ourselves to receive the healing of our caring God. Welcome, welcome to God's love. At the height of our joy or in the depths of our despair, in the sunshine of our hope and in the shadows of our shame, God's love seeks us out. Let us experience how we are always made welcome by our inclusive God. And we'll sing the third verse of Come and Find the Quiet Center. That's 375 in Voices United as our introit. In the Spirit let us travel, open to each other's pain. Let our loves and fears unravel, celebrate the space we gain. There's a place for deepest dreaming, there's a time for hearts to spirits lively scheming there is always room to spare and let us pray And this is a prayer by Wendy McLean. Creating loving God. In Christ you show us a way to heal and to shape a new day. And you entrust us with the gifts of faith, forgiveness, compassion, trust, and love. In the changing seasons, in the changing world, your love is constant. May our witness and prayer sustain and support goodness, justice, and peace in our worship and work, enough for this day and for all the generations who follow. Amen. The readings for this Sunday focus on the healing ministry of Jesus, and so healing is a strong theme in our prayers and in our music for this Sunday. And uh, we start with 570 in Voices United. Jesus' hands were kind hands. It's often listed as a children's hymn, but as we've often remarked, uh, sometimes the very best teachings and the, the very best learnings come to us through the hymnody that we reserve for children. So it is uh, a small hymn in some ways, but an important hymn. 570, Jesus' hands were kind hands. hands were kind hands doing good to all healing 
pain and sickness, blessing children small, washing tired feet, and saving those who fall. Jesus' hands were kind hands, doing good to all. Take my hands, O oh Jesus, let them work for you. Make them strong and gentle, kind in all I do. Let me watch you, Jesus, Till I'm gentle too, till my hands are kind hands, quick to work for you. Amen. At this time, I'm going to invite Bruce Jackson to bring the reading for this Sunday. Good morning. This morning's scripture reading is from the fifth ch chapter of Mark, verses 21 to 43. It's about a young girl who was sick, died and was raised, and a hemorrhaging woman who was healed. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders, named Jairus, came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her, so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors, and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, because, she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? His disciples answered, you see the people crowding against you, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kaum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. And that is this morning's scripture reading. Thank you, Bruce. In preparation for this Sunday, I was inviting people to consider what's going to happen within ourselves and in our communities coming out of uh, these lockdowns that we've been experiencing with COVID that 
uh, remarking that there will take a little time perhaps for people to get comfortable once again with, with being with one another and with doing all of those things which a year and a half ago we took for granted and now suddenly not so much anymore. And, and what are you feeling that you will need healing? What areas of your life do you feel you might need healing in uh, as we come out of this, as we hopefully head into phase two and then finally phase three in Ontario, which sounds like, uh, to my ear anyway, business as usual, but we'll find out more, I'm sure, as we know by now the road can twist and turn in many different ways. But it feels as if we will start to, to look a bit like normal uh, in about a month and a half, maybe by the fall, uh, but if it looks like normal, the question is always, will it feel like normal? And for some of us, it may take some time. That's the thing when it comes to, to healing within a community, that, that often it's, it's going to take different uh, steps and, and different timelines for different people. I can only imagine what it's like for people who have lost loved ones in the midst of all of this those heartbreaking stories of people being uh, alone in a hospital room or, or their family not being able to be with them. And clearly that's the kind of hurt and the kind of pain that's going to take some time to work through. And people will long remember 2020 and parts of 2021 as, as being times in their lives where, where things broke apart in a way that was very hard for them to put back together. Just now, once again, that we are in graduation season, I'm reflecting on how for our young people, you know, where those, li those years in, in high school, those years in, in public school are so precious and, and for development and, and the, the opportunities that, that young people have that may have only been once in a lifetime opportunities, opportunities to travel, perhaps, or certainly opportunities to graduate with your friends and community and that's been taken from you, and that's something that, that we'll never be able to come back in quite the same way. I mean, perhaps there'll be recreations down the road, or there'll be opportunities for people to, to come together, but there's sometimes something about that moment which is, which is so precious, it's so fleeting, but it's so powerful in that very moment that that, that cannot be reconstructed again. So again, for, for many of those people, for some of our young people, the road to healing will be a difficult one. Those who deal with, with physical sickness, with mental illness, uh, those things have been in many ways made worse through the times that we've spent apart where we haven't been able to socialize in, in ways that offer healing for some people. Uh, and even for those who are facing surgery, obviously, those things get delayed and, and the list goes on. And, and from my perspective, I think of myself, I mean, I'm, I'm a single guy. I've been blessed to be able to continue to do this, this worship throughout COVID. Um, you know, there's been some things that have been challenging, but honestly, for me, I think I'm, I'm going to come out of this, as far as I know, uh, with a fairly short timeline for, for getting back into the swing of things, you know, back into my groove. It may be a little weird to see actual live people you know, out in the pews once again. But aside from that, I think I will be able to manage. But part of my responsibility is to be sensitive to the fact that even though I'll be back and, and feeling pretty good about things, for others, it's going to be a, a harder road, a longer road, a more challenging road. And so I have to be aware of that. And I think that's the calling for all of us as we come back together into community to be sensitive to the fact that for some people it's going to be a struggle and and to resist the temptation to just say oh come on like let's let's go see a movie or let's go you know do the things that we used to do and for some people it may be you know, I just I'm, I'm really not ready to do that just yet and and to be accepting of such things healing is such a complex and varied process and it's certainly made clear to us in Mark's Gospel with this, this, this powerful reading that we have for this Sunday. Now Mark, because it's the shortest Gospel, and in many ways the simply, simplestly written, simplestly? God, there's got to be a better way. The most simple, there we go, the most simple. The most simple, uh, simply written of the Gospels. It sometimes gets a bad rap 
that, that people think of it as a, as a somewhat primitive example of a gospel. It doesn't have the, the fullness of story that, say, Luke or Matthew have. It doesn't have the, the rich vocabulary and the powerful imagery of John's gospel. And yet, the writer of Mark has done a masterful work here in combining two stories of healing just to show the varieties of experience that people have in healing. Look at all the contrasts that are in this story. We have the wealthy synagogue leader, Jairus. We have the impoverished woman. We have uh, someone who's been waiting for a very long time for healing, but gets healed immediately upon the touch of Jesus' cloak. Contrast that with the, the immediacy of the need of Jairus, Jairus, I knew I was going to do that, the, the immediacy of Jairus' need, and then that he has to wait in order for his daughter to be restored. Economic levels play a role, social status plays a role, privacy in the healing of the daughter being healed in a very private and intimate way with just her family being present. We have the public healing of the, the woman in the crowd surrounded by people. There are so many different ways of being healed that are explained and elicited and, and brought out in this story. It is a marvelous work. But what holds these stories together in all their variety of experience is faith in the Christ and faith in the possibility of healing. That woman who had been waiting with the hemorrhage for so long, who had gone through so many treatments that the doctors had tried so many different things with her and the hint is essentially that she's bankrupted herself with all of these attempts, like, that it, it's broken her down to, to, to almost nothing, just to a shell of herself. But she's heard about Jesus, and she knows that, that if she could just get close to him, that she trusts that, that healing could happen, even after all of those setbacks, all of that disappointment, her faith is still strong in the potential to be healed. Incidentally, that's another difference in the two stories, isn't it? That, that, that she is there, um, and it's almost by accident that Jesus is being called deliberately to be involved in a, in a healing by Jairus. But it's only through him calling Jesus that there's almost this accidental added blessing that, that his path crosses with this woman. So again, for some healing can come at direction and, and, and a, in a deliberate way, and then for others healing can come almost unexpectedly by a, a synchronistic moment. But she trusts that healing could come. And Jairus, know something about Jesus that his daughter might be able to be healed. And they make space for the healing to happen. And Jesus enters in and Jesus performs these, these miraculous healings. But, but Jesus himself is very clear that, that what has made for healing in these circumstances is the faith of the people involved. We're going to read, or I don't know if we read this, I think next week we skip over this story in our readings for this cycle, but the reading that immediately follows this is the rejection of Jesus in Nazareth. And Mark informs us that Jesus could do no healings, he could do no acts of power in his hometown. And why? Because they were saying, who is this carpenter's son? They had no time for Jesus, they had no trust in, in what he was representing to them, the power of God to make life new and to offer new beginnings. 
And finally, one last aspect which needs to be picked up in this story is that the hemorrhaging woman, some commentators have seen, symbolizes um, an unclean or a ritually unclean individual because that, that bleeding would make her unclean, would cut her off from temple practice, would cut her off from her community, but that she represents one aspect of, of Israel, of, of the larger people. That if there is an uncleanliness, if there is a breach, if there is a disconnect between the people and their faith, that, that Jesus is offering hope there as well, that they can reconnect with their God. And that the young girl, the 12-year-old, who is right on the verge of, of, of entering into uh, being able to, to be sexually aware and active, like just on the cusp of, of that, that growth, and that change in, in her physical nature represents the future of Israel, that these two women represent uh, more than just themselves, but a larger idea of healing and of hope for a future and for reconnection. So we take all of these forms of healing into our hearts and, and we ask ourselves, do we believe in the potential for healing? Do we have faith that believes that, that God can do these things in our hearts and in our communities and offer us new futures? As a church, I think we have to face again what's been going on in the past week or two around these discoveries of, of, of unmarked graves within First Nations communities. And we need to understand that for many of these First Nations, their history is that they they knew that these graves were somewhere, that in their oral history, in their teachings, they, they, they told one another that our friends disappeared when we were young, and, and where did they go? They must have gone somewhere. So it's shocking, and it's deeply upsetting, but it's, it's part of the process of reconciliation that, that Indigenous people have been longing for and need to have space for in this wider Canada. I don't know if you were able to catch the, the press conference from the Kawasis First Nation and Chief DeLorme, but, but he was saying that this is an opportunity for, for his community to, to begin one, one phase of healing. And, and what he asked of us, what he asks of the wider community is to stand with us as we heal. Again, it goes back to being sensitive to, to others and it, it goes back to being aware that people heal in different ways and it goes back to having trust that healing can actually happen. So perhaps for, for us it's a time to, to listen, a, a time to be witnesses to healing, happening in others, to just keep silence for a while, as hard as that is. I was listening to uh, a comedian talking about how white guys like him and like me have pretty much had the stage for about 400 years, and maybe it's time that we just shut up for a bit. And, and he shuts up for about two minutes, two seconds. And then he says, I'm bored and goes back to talking again. And I think, as sad as that is, uh, it's tragic in a way, but it's true. Like, we, we can't slow ourselves down sometimes enough to, to just be present, to, to, to understand that healing takes time for many, many people, and we can't rush it. And I know I need to do some work to be a better listener and to be more aware of how others heal. And you know how I know that is because immediately after the chief spoke, uh, a knowledge keeper came on from the community and, and she shared her story. An 80 year old woman named Florence who went to this school where they discovered these, these unmarked graves and, and she wanted to tell a part of her story. And I started to get very agitated as I was listening to and I was wondering what is going on why am I feeling like that and I suddenly realized because it's news world or I'm listening I think it was on news world it might have been the, the CTV news but when you're listening to that channel they give like two minutes for a story 
Two minutes for a story. Headline, headline, headline. We have a talking head. And if the talking head can't get the point across in two minutes or less, they don't have them on the TV. You will never in your life see someone who stutters as a commentator on one of these shows. They just don't allow the time. Because everything has to be quick and they go to the next story and they go to the next story. And here's someone who's going to say something brilliant about this. And here's somebody who's going to say something about this. And then sometimes even in the midst of a conversation, they have to cut them off because it's time for an ad or it's time for the headlines or it's time for something else. But when Florence spoke, she spoke at her own pace. She spoke in her own way. And it took a little time. And the stories ran together. And they required some, some serious listening on their own time. And my discomfort to me is a big hint that I'm not really that good at, at just stopping and being with someone who needs to take time to heal. But I have hope that it can happen. I just need to work at it and keep working at it. And I think we all need to do the same. And if, if just listening seems a little too passive for those of you out there who want to do things, consider working on how you listen as something you can do. Or maybe shifting attitudes a little bit. It occurs to me that in, in our history as, as the Canadian nation, in dealing with Indigenous people and dealing with First Nations, we've tended to see First Nations in perhaps some very flattened one-dimensional ways. We've tended to either see them as convenient allies, as enemies, or as a social problem. We've seen Indigenous people as convenient allies, enemies, or as a social problem. And none of those things in any way fully encompass what Indigenous people are. Any more than I would like to be described in the richness of who I am in one or two words. And if we're going to listen well, we need to come into that period of listening well. We need to make space for the listening to happen. And we need to challenge the, precon the preconceived notions that we have about others and about ourselves. Canada is going to feel different after all of this. And I think it should. It doesn't mean that we're bad people. We, I've been thinking about this too. You know, people want to think that we're essentially good people. And this feels as if, you know, we're being challenged on that front. And I've been thinking a lot about how the early theologians and the gospel writers talked about how God is good. Only God is good. We try. We are called to be the best that we can be. But in trying to be good people, inevitably, we are going to get things wrong because we're not perfect. Because we're not completely and fully good in the way that God is good. How could we be? It doesn't mean we stop trying. But we try to be good. Sometimes we get things wrong. And we do wrong. But doing wrong doesn't make good people bad people. What makes good people bad people is when we do something wrong and make no effort to, to try to address the thing that we've done wrong. Either we can't acknowledge that it was wrong in the first place, or we want to just put it aside and forget about it, or we resist any opportunity to try to, to do something to make it right. And I think that's where sometimes we lose our way. It'll be a painful process for many people. But it's so important. Healing happens in so many different ways, but Jesus tells us to hope in God and to trust that healing is real, that it comes through faith, that it comes through making an effort to reach out to touch the hem of the garment, to, to call the healer. And healing can be found. 
So if it's time for us to be quiet, to still our hearts, to make space for others to heal, so that this nation and in all of its relationships, in all our relations, as the Mohawk people say, we will be better together for it. May it be so. Oh, man. This is a, a hymn out of more voices. Uh, it's at 132 if you want to follow along, if you have more voices at home. But it's based on, on this reading from Mark and the two stories interwoven together. Great sorrow prodded Jairus. of a, a minute for mission, I, I did want to share with us, or with you, uh, a letter that came to um, the United Church uh, uh, church leaders, uh, ministers, uh, lay leaders, colleagues in ministry, and this was uh, released to us uh, from on June the 25th, 2021, and it's written by our, our moderator, the Right Reverend Richard Bott. And he writes, I am writing you as the truth about unmarked graves on the sites of former residential schools continues to emerge, confirming what many people of indigenous communities have said and known for years. I know that you and members of our congregations have questions about what the church is doing or will be doing in response. The General Secretary and I are working with the indigenous ministries and justice staff 
to reach out to the communities affected by the 15 schools that we operated. We want to ensure that our denomination's response is firmly grounded in the principles of right relationship that we seek to live. This is ongoing work that requires our support and participation. As the conversations continue, I will keep you updated. This is a time for the United Church of Canada to listen rather than prescribe. The pain in Indigenous communities and churches is immense. I ask you to continue to hold Indigenous members of the United Church and their families and communities in prayer and ask members of your community of faith to do the same. Blessings, the Right Reverend Richard Bott, moderator of the United Church of Canada. Let us pray. Loving God, we give thanks for powerful stories of healing that we find in scripture, that we find in our lived experience. Moments in life where, where wholeness and oneness become real to us once again after experiencing pain, brokenness and loss. We know that for some healing comes quickly we know that for others, healing takes time. Help us to be good listeners, good presence, as we live and move amongst others in our community who are on many different stages, in many different pathways, in many different roads in the path towards healing. We ask that you would be with those who have deep grief through COVID, through loss and through loss of opportunity. Give us the strength to walk with people as we return once again to whatever the normal will be. We pray for our Indigenous brothers and sisters, our family, as they are walking through deep grief themselves with these recent discoveries. Help us to be strong enough to make space, strong enough to listen, strong enough to stand with, not apart from or against, as we have been called to do. We recognize that there is a variety of experience in those gathered in, in this place through the computers, through the screens, which is our way of communicating right now. But we would ask that you would hear the prayers of all of your people Prayers for hope, prayers for new beginnings and for reopenings, reawakenings, reimaginings, prayers about the pains that we feel, prayers about our own wondering whether we will ever know healing or oneness in the midst of pain. Strengthen our faith, we pray. And hear the prayers of your people this morning.
We pray in Jesus' name, who taught these words to us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So we have a hymn for healing as our closing hymn. It's number 617 in uh, Voices United. And it's called, I Love You God Who Heard My Cry. again next, next week. week. Oh, something, something that I meant to, to bring up to you. Some of you might be wondering about our own schedule and, and how we, we hope to see this reopening happening. And we have had uh, a couple of uh, discussions about that uh, with our, our visioning and transitioning committee and then talking to the chairs of the, the two uh, the church communities that we have. And we are looking at staying very much in this format through the summer. And then we are hoping in uh, Labor Day, so Labor Day Sunday, which I think is the 5th of September, no, when is it, whenever it is, the first Sunday in September. Um, I think it's the 5th, because the 12th is, is uh, the next Sunday. The 5th would be a, a picnic uh, at the manse. So it'll be a service and uh, we can bring some food and we can sit in lawn chairs out on the slope, the 5th it is. So the 5th is the, the first Sunday in September. That would hopefully be an opportunity for us to get back together, at least in an outdoors type space, and, uh, and to worship as a community. And then the following Sunday is Olivet's anniversary. So we're hopeful that at that point, if things are back to, to the, the new normal, that we'll be able to meet in, in church together and we'll celebrate the reopening uh, uh, and the regathering at the anniversary service at Olivet on the 12th, then we'd have a, a, a regular service the following week, and I'm adding sevens here, so the 12th, that would be the 19th, would also be at Olivet, and then we would shift for the next two weeks here to Sealy's Bay, which means that the first Sunday back in Sealy's Bay in the church with people gathered would be Sealy's Bay's anniversary service, uh, which, no, maybe it would be the second one. Anyway, it's in there somewhere. But the idea being that both the churches would be able to reopen on their anniversaries. And after all of that, we'll have had a meeting of our official board again in September, and we'll be able to have a clearer idea of what we're gonna do going forward. But anyway, that's the plan as it stands now. We're going to stay like this format through the summer. We will come together for, for the long weekend on Labor Day for a Sunday outdoors at the Mance, and then we will go back to worshiping in service still i believe having uh, either a recording or a live broadcast depending on the circumstance and dave's patience and then we will go on from there so that's the hope anyway but as we say you just never know but in the meantime may the love of god and the peace of christ and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you now 
and always. Why don't we? <laughs> I, I mean, it doesn't, but Dave has the words up, and I think people are kind of just. <laughs> Is it a new tune to Go Now in Peace? What's he done? They're trying to sing that <laughs> to that tune. Go now in peace. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.